geopolitics and empire is joined by a man who I think needs little introduction, John Perkins, the economic hitman. The third edition of Confessions of an Economic Hitman is out right now. Uh, I've been uh, loving the book. It deals with China's economic hitman strategy and ways to stop the global takeover. Welcome to Geopolitics and Empire, Mr. Perkins. Thank you so much, Hervé, for, for having me aboard again, and please refer to me as John. <laughs> All right, uh, John. Yeah, this is the third time we, we've talked over eight or nine years, so uh, it's it's uh, uh, fun. And you know, it was a joy to reread parts of the old confessions mixed in with the brand spanking new uh, material. So again, I highly recommend folks get the book. Uh, it's been many years since I've read it, and I thought we could start with the big picture and then drill down uh you know the economic hitman model uh perhaps for those who aren't familiar with the book and you said something interesting in the book that you don't believe in some nefarious illegal secret plot by a group of people for world domination rather a series of small conspiracies i do tend to believe in a in a broader plot for a global uh domination you know maybe my view could be made up of you, you put together all those smaller steps uh of, of of conspiracies but in any case you end up with sort of a the natural you know outgrowth or consequence uh of this monopolization of power and you call it a global takeover um you know this global empire global corporate uh empire and where do you see this standing today this this global uh corporate government how much has it advanced well so yeah so so what i mean by not no conspiracy and no you know grand conspiracy i don't see a group of, a small group of men maybe maybe a few women i don't know getting together in some smoke you know cigar chopping the old the old image in a room and and plotting to take over the world that's I don't see that, but what I do see is what I call the corporatocracy, which is uh, you know a group of people that are all driven by the same goal, and that is to maximize short-term profits, regardless of the social and environmental costs. This extreme form of capitalism, what we might call predatory capitalism, and uh, you know we, we we are seeing that uh, in the United States. We're seeing that in China now, big time. So the book goes into a lot of detail. The, the, one of the subtitles of the book is uh, China's Economic Hitman Strategy. And what we really have today is these two superpowers, both of whom, both of which are driven by corporations to a very large degree. And in China, it's 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 a little bit more transparent. The, the Chinese government has large ownership in, in corporations, and it's very obvious. In the United States, it's a little less transparent, but it's it's there that nobody gets elected to a high office in the U.S. without the a lot of money that comes through corporations, one way or another. And we've got this revolving door where people move from being CEO of a big corporation like an oil company and to becoming you know, part of the, the government that, that writes the regulations for oil companies and then goes back to the oil company. So, you know, it, it's, it's this corporatocracy and it's driven. It, it, it is a, a single kind of unit to control the world and its resources. Um, and what we have also realized, and I think that probably the most important theme of this this new book, is that it's got to end. It's you know we've created a death economy, an economic system that's consuming and polluting itself into extinction, and that in the short term is depleting the resources it needs for the long term. That's not working, and it's it's what's causing climate change and income inequality, species extinctions. All the other, many of the other crises that we're we're facing, so we've got to, create, to transform that into a life economy, an economic system that pays people to clean up pollution, to uh, regenerate the destroyed environments, to recycle, you know, uh, to create technologies like solar and wind and things we haven't even thought of yet uh, that will that will take us into a long term commitment to to life surviving as as we know it on this planet um and uh i think we you know i'm hopeful that we're on the way toward doing that yeah i, I enjoyed your uh conclusion as well and suggestions i found i found that i already have been practicing uh many of them but i don't want to jump ahead something you mentioned in your in your book as well uh where you've discussed the military solution for uh global domination whether it's you know american empire and post World War II, it no longer became viable because of nuclear uh, warfare and 
weapons and now it seems the drive for corporate empire is via political warfare unrestricted warfare psychological economic information cultural warfare and you just mentioned china i mean and, and now we have this sort of paradigm this new cold war that's discussed east versus west uh you know us eu nato versus russia china or eurasia and you know there's talk of a you know third world war do, do you see this sort of the chinese corporate empire vying for global domination with the western corporate empire how do you see this current uh global situation yeah it's there's definitely a competition there it's it's a race to disaster actually if you think of it as 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 a competition as a race but it's so complex because china's economy and the u.s economy are, are so interlocked they're so interwoven it's you know it's so while we we talk about competition and while our politicians, both in China and the United States, and in Russia and in Ukraine and all over, are they, they go? They're going back to this this Cold War idea of them and us, and how we we're, we're faced with a possibility of a new war. It's a terrible idea, obviously. Uh, you know, we we need to be looking at the real problems of the world, which are climate change and, and income inequality and people starving to death and pandemics. And and th this, this this idea that they, they, whoever they are, are the enemy and we're the good guys, they're the bad guys, we're the good, the good guys, it's it's taking us backwards. It's taking us back into this, the, into our past history of, of violence and, and them versus us. Uh, we, we, we must move beyond that if we if we intend to survive as a species, you know, the old saying, no one wins on a dead planet. Uh, and so this competition is is incredibly destructive. So the real question is, how do we move beyond that? And unfortunately, um, politics, and right now in the United States, of course, we've got, we're entering a new presidential election era. And you know that the Republicans and the Democrats, they're both going to have to prove that they're tough on China. And at the same time, uh, Xi Jinping and the Chinese government is reacting by saying, "Well, we've got to defend ourselves from that." They, 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 you know, they they say we're being surrounded and encompassed uh, by the by the Americans and the and the transatlantic uh, alliance, basically the NATO, uh, and that's why they're 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 somewhat siding with Russia. So, you know, we're at this ridiculous, insane <laughs> time in human history. If you if you really look at it, that, that we know that we're plunging forward into disaster. Uh, and yet we continue to, rather than looking at how do we create a new model, a new paradigm, we're, we're, we're dropping back into this antagonistic mold. A quick shout out to our sponsors, which you can locate via the sponsor page on geopoliticsandempire.com or whose links are included in every podcast description. I've tried privacy phones in the past, such as Silent Circle's Black Phone, which turned out to be a dud. The best and really only option so far is de-googling your phone. Now, you can do it yourself, but I've never had the time to figure that out and simply got an above phone. They sell degoogled phones that come with a suite of software. They also provide support and a monthly above privacy suite with many features such as a unique phone number, encryption, email, VPN, and so forth. If you're looking for a private phone, check out above phone. Make sure to click on the above phone link on geopoliticsandempire.com or via the podcast description so that we can enjoy a commission. Also, check out the Nomos Time Bank at nomos.net, which you can download in Spanish or English to your Apple or Google or de-Googled phone. Nomos allows people in your community to exchange services using time as a currency rather than fiat money. This will be one great way to survive in the coming algorithm ghetto. If you need health insurance, you can talk to my friend James Guzman of the Borderless Blog Podcast and Health Insurance. He offers free consultations. Simply schedule a time with him over at borderlesshealthinsurance.com. Finally, you can donate directly to Geopolitics and Empire, consult with me, the host, or become a member to join private monthly member Zoom calls where we shoot the breeze discussing world events. And, you know, most of my guests these days, I've been talking about this for years, that I feel like we're in a once in a century crisis uh, moment. And more and more of my guests are agreeing. Yeah, yeah, like things are just bad on, on all fronts as you 
outline and you know something uh, also came to mind while reading your book uh, you you just mentioned in passing the pandemic you don't really touch on that in the book but i i saw part of the economic hitman model at play during uh, the pandemic and early on um you know you've explained how the imf and world bank are used to take over uh, nations and early in the pandemic the president of belarus uh, lukashenko perhaps a few other leaders revealed that the IMF and the World Bank came to them and offered them a pile of money, but with the requirement that if they took that money, they would have to mandate uh, you know, masks and vaccines and lockdowns and, and shutdowns of their country. Lukashenko uh, refused. And, you know, I'm just wondering your thoughts on that. You know, it might suggest, you know, the, 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 the IMF and World Bank were attempting to hijack or use pandemic protocols as sort of a economic hitman warfare model because we know a lot of countries got into uh uh debt and there was a lot of transfer of wealth during the pandemic any thought uh, on that well whatever you think about masks and vaccines and so on and so forth the fact of the matter is that the imf and the world bank have a long history of trying to control other countries uh, economies and, and 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 you know neoliberal economics which is what I was very deeply involved in as a chief economist, economic hitman back in when I was doing that work. Uh, and it's one of the reasons that China now has the number one trading partner and, uh, um, and an investor in 124 countries versus the U.S.'s 48. Uh, the, China has taken over. Uh, it's not when will China take over. It's China has taken over in the last few years uh, since well, she became the leader of China in 2012, 2013. And in a very short period of time, China has taken over. And one of the reasons is because uh, China makes a big point of the fact that they do not practice neoliberal economics. And just to sum it up very, very quickly, neoliberal economics means that you, the IMF or whoever goes into a country and says, hey, if you want to take our loans, if you want to have good conditions, then uh, you've got to... Uh, You've got to privatize your major businesses, sell them to our investors. You've got to deregulate. Don't, don't, you know, drop regulations. And uh, you've got to uh, stop taxing the rich people or drop taxes on the rich and drop social services uh, to, to everyone else. And so th there's a whole set of very onerous uh, conditions imposed on countries and countries resent that. And China makes the point of look when we give you a loan, we, we we don't we don't we don't impose any conditions. We don't impose any conditions. Now that's not entirely true. They do want to be with China in the issue over Taiwan and Hong Kong and other things, but it's a good selling point. And in fact, they don't. They're not nearly as as aggressive at imposing conditions as the United States. So in a way, the, the United States and its its banks, uh, like the World Bank and IMF, which we basically control in the U.S., uh, have shot ourselves in the foot because we've we've irritated, we've aggravated countries around the world that don't want to be dictated to how they how they run their system, how they run their governments, and, and China doesn't doesn't do that nearly as much as the U.S. does, and so it's it's been a winning point for them. And yeah, I mean. Then to get more into China, you um, mentioned in your book how, again, here's the book, go out and get it, physical or digital copy, but uh, they're using the IMF World Bank uh, EHM model. They've created, you know, they're using the BRICS Bank, the AIIB uh, Bank, and, you know, they're doing something kind of similar yet different. But ultimately, you conclude that what China is doing is the same thing that, the you know, the U.S. with IMF and World Bank have been doing, that it's a it's a lose-lose scenario. It, it, it leads to the death of... Uh, uh, economy that you know that they do put countries into debt they do influence national policy maybe not to the same extent that the west uh, did that they do they do build infrastructure to integrate countries with the entire world as you said but sometimes that in infrastructure is kind of a uh, crappy as you mentioned the dam in uh ecuador and so what real difference would you say is there between the the, the chinese uh model and the imf world bank model well <clears throat> the biggest difference is a, a different story, which is a very powerful marketing tool that China has, and that is to say that it it had a, a, a approximately ten percent economic growth every year for thirty years, 
And it's, it's brought more than 800, 800 million people out of poverty, dire poverty. It's more than the rest of the world combined. No other country has ever done anything like what China has accomplished in a very short period of time. And at the same time, uh, it, it has, it, it, like, like I said before, it doesn't impose as draconian conditions on other countries as, as the U.S. and its allies do when it makes loans. Um, so if you're the leader of, of Ecuador or Nigeria or many other countries around the world, and you, you have a lot of resources in the ground, oil, lithium, cobalt, the things that are necessary for the green economy, you, you don't have the finances and the technical know-how to, to develop those resources. You gotta go, you gotta turn to someone. And the choice is pretty much these days are China or the United States. And if you look at, at the recent history of China and the story China has to tell about its incredible economic growth and the fact it's not going to impose some of these conditions. And another thing, and that is that the United States has a long history of putting military bases on foreign soils. And we even have a history of over helping to overthrow governments, as we've done in places like Chile and, and Iran and in Vietnam and, and the Congress. So, so many, many countries where we've admitted that we've been involved in these act actions and, and even assassinations, and China doesn't have that history. Uh, and so if you're the leader of one of these countries, you say, you know, well, who would I rather turn to? And it's not that difficult for leaders to conclude that as, as they have throughout Africa, much of Latin America today, they've turned to China. And that is not to say that they want the Chinese system. They don't. And they don't particularly like the Chinese culture or, you know, they don't really relate to Chinese people. They're, they're much, they, they, they're, they're, you know, they accept Americans uh, much more readily than, than the Chinese who tend to live in their own enclaves, et cetera. But the system, but the economics and the, the 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 need to take loans and to bring in another country's technical know-how uh, and markets, uh, it, 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 China is extremely appealing to many of these countries for those reasons. <laughs> I, I wanted to jump back to uh, Latin America. Something that stood out reading uh, your book and this idea of protecting national resources uh, and decision making and, and sovereignty not being particularly a left right or issue or you know socialist and i'm not a socialist or a marxist uh, i i'm a conservative but living here in amlos uh mexico i, I you know i'm astonished uh, a lot of our utilities are still public utilities electricity water uh, and I kind of enjoy paying five dollars a month for electricity, uh, five bucks a month, you know, fifty dollars a year for my water. I mean, that's and in the U.S. You're paying like monthly, you know, hundred hundreds of bucks for this stuff, and you know, subsidized public utility. And I think it really helps the us, the citizens, the population here in in Mexico. And we see AMLO nationalizing Mexican lithium, trying to retain control. He, he just he's building a, a, a Mexican refinery so we can. Uh, you know, refine our own oil instead of outsourcing it to these foreign corporations and to the U.S. And so in many respects, I see this as a good thing, just trying to retain your own sovereignty and, you know, your thoughts on, on this issue, uh, perhaps Mexico or, you know, how do you how do you see other countries around the world today in, in dealing with uh, trying to retain their uh, sovereignty? Yeah, well, I think, you know, it's it, there is the blowback from the colonial era of, uh, well, in Mexico, you had the, the Spaniards, you had Spanish, you know, the conquistadores, the whole colonialization of all of Latin America by Spain or Portugal. And then more recently, it's been pretty much the United States and in a much more subtle way, but nonetheless, it's happening. And uh, there's this tremendous resentment. And I think what most people in the United States I don't understand is that the immigration problem, for example, just to take one example, as I'm sure you're aware, is is really created by our what we call free trade agreements, NAFTA and the North American Atlantic, the North North American Free Trade Agreement, and CAFTA, the Central American Free Trade Agreement. And as as a simple example, and I may the numbers are not again not necessarily, but let's assume that it costs a, a, an American producer $10 to produce a, a bushel of something, corn. 
and and uh, it it cost the uh, the uh, uh, Central American campesino uh, only uh, seven dollars to produce that. So the campesino can sell it for eight dollars and make a profit, but the American corporation gets a huge subsidy, let's say five dollars. So they can sell it for six dollars and still make a dollar, and it th- it puts the campesino out of business. And we've seen that over and over and over because these free trade agreements, free trade agreements allow for countries to have subsidies, which means the United States, because Mexico and most Central American countries can't uh, afford to subsidize their farmers, but it doesn't allow for tariffs. So there's no way that the, the countries can say, okay, so you, you, you've got a subsidy in the United States, uh, so, you, so your, your, your farmers can sell it for six, but we're going to put a tariff on, so it costs eight, so you're kind of an equal basis with our own. They can't do that. So the campesino goes out of business, can't, can't, farm anymore and that has a huge impact on the whole economy of every of these countries the uh, you know the all the people who buy and sell from the local farmer and so they go out of business and and what are they what can they do they can go they can try to go to work for a sweatshop that provides goods and services to american corporations or they leave so if we want to solve the immigration problem it's Help these economies be, 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 you know, make a fair, a level playing field for these economies to play on. So, you know, we, we've we've really created this horrendous situation, and we in the United States tend to think we're, 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 we're the good guys. We're doing all these good things. These these trade agreements are helpful to all these. They're, they're not helpful. They're helpful to big corporations primarily. We have this horrible, horrible bias toward our own big corporations. And really, it's not fair to call them American corporations or U.S. corporations because they don't pay taxes. A lot of them don't pay taxes. Uh, and they and they, they don't even employ people and, and, and they're buying many of their own components from China, from other countries. It's it's a very, very fascinating time that we're in and, and, and it's a time of, of extreme crisis that hopefully is pushing us to understand that we must change. We must change. Yeah, I, I've seen you know firsthand the the damage that you know NAFTA. I think now that's NAFTA 2.0 USMCA uh, that has wrought. You know, uh, I've met Robert Pastor, uh, uh, one of the leading proponents of integrating uh, North America based on NAFTA, and um, you know it's put mil- as you said it put millions of Mexican uh, uh, farm workers out of work, and you see them now in the cities here in urban areas in Mexico because th- there, there's no work or desperately trying to get to the U.S. So it's it's a problem of our own making. And you know, I've got Mexican friends here. W- one that was just, uh, uh, they had the family broken up, you know, the 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 uh, the wife of my friend, uh, you know, he, he's working in the U.S. legally, but, uh, you know, there was some issue and they wouldn't let her go ahead. Uh, the, the kid went ahead. He, he, the kid is a citizen. He went with his uncle. And so you've got all these sorts of problems. And, um, again, it's, it's our own making and coming back to China and, and the Middle East. You touch on that in your book. Uh, we recently had Xi Jinping brokering peace between Saudi Arabia and Iran. Uh, it seems like China's again, in many ways, becoming a major global player. And you know, on top of that, China is advancing de-dollarization with countries like Iraq and Saudi Arabia uh, taking payment for certain goods and trades, no longer in dollars, but uh, yuan. Uh, you know, and any thoughts on uh, the rise of China uh, in this sense? And sort of like, you know, are we going to shift from the whole petrodollar system to the petro yuan? And in many respects, it's, it seems like the U- U.S. is losing losing its uh, hegemony. Well, there's no question that the U.S. U.S. is losing its hegemony, and and, and China's taking over. And yes, that you know, and the the number one foreign currency in Russia today is is the yuan, and uh, you know because uh, it R- Russia is selling, uh, China's buying more oil and, and gas from Russia than ever before, and I think more than it's buying from any other country now. It's and it's paying for them in yuan, and and like you said striking a deal with with Iraq and Saudi Arabia um I, I you know China recognizes that whoever controls the world currency controls commerce and that's the dollar right now in the US and we would not be able to put sanctions on other countries if they if, if the dollar wasn't so powerful and so obviously part of China's strategy here is to 
get rid of the dollar as the first <laughs> currency. But they need to do it a little slowly. And I know this because they owed a lot of money from the U.S. and other countries in dollars. And so uh, they got to be a little careful. They don't want to see the U.S. economy crash because the U.S. is a huge market for them. Uh, in many many ways, and and very de- and they're very dependent on. It. I mean, this interchange, um, China and the United States combined uh, create almost half of the world's GDP, the world's e- economy, the way we measure economy, and about the same amount of the world's pollution. And you know, this again, I want to keep returning to this idea that this this race, this competition, is just a race to disaster. And this idea that we have to change, you mentioned the pandemic a little while ago, and I think it's important to recognize that the pandemic taught us that we can change, and we can even enjoy the change, we can benefit from the change, you know, we, uh, people learn to play the flute, <laughs> people learn to, people wrote a book that they'd always wanted to write, or read a book that they'd always wanted to read, you know, we, 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 we coped with that change, we didn't like it, to begin with, especially. Uh, but it taught us that we can change when we need to, and uh, we can we can do it in a way that, that serves our best interest. And I think that's where we are now: is this uh, to, to transition from a death to a life economy. And I will say that you know I taught at an MBA program in, in Shanghai, and it was considered the, the, the top MBA program in China at the time. And a lot of Chinese students, I was fascinated about how they. They said, you know, we've created an economic miracle in China. We've had this magnificent growth. We brought all these people out of poverty. It's come at a terrible price uh, socially and environmentally. And we've suffered. These students are saying, you know, we live through horrible, horrible pollution. We don't want that for our kids or grandchildren. We've created a miracle at an awful price. But now we're going to turn that miracle around and be the greenest country on the planet. It was a really amazing thing for me to hear from them. And I and I know there was it's just sincere. Will, will they do it? I don't know. But in fact, I came back from that trip. And very soon after that, I was speaking at a, at a conference of about 2,000 U.S. MBA students. It happened to be held in Corn- Cornell that year. And I told them that story, these U.S. students, and uh, I said, don't don't let China be number one environmentally and socially. Let it be the United States. Let's have a World Cup in uh, who is the greenest, which country every year does the most to to create the life economy. And, and you know, we are, we've been on the road to that, uh, you know, the idea of conscious capitalism, of benefit corporations, big corporations, the incredible rise of solar and wind power. Very rapidly, uh, and we've we've been we've been moving in that direction. The the problem is we've now gotten very very diverted from the goal of of moving in that direction and, and ending climate change. We've gotten di- diverted by the pandemic, and now by you know the war in Ukraine and the competition between the China, Russia, India, you know U.S. All these. And, and European factions that are are struggling to, their politicians are struggling to use all of these things as ways to get elected or reelected. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned conscious capitalism. I, th- I think I got the book. Uh, yeah, it's right there behind me. I think it was the the, the head of uh, the guy who started Whole Foods uh, uh, wrote the book. And uh, I, I did want to ask you because. Kazakhstan is dear to my heart. I, I, in your book, you mentioned that you were there uh, in 2017, and that's when I was there. I went, I went off to Kazakhstan in 2017, from 2017 to 2021. I technically I worked. Uh, my employer, my boss, was Nur Sultan Nazarbayev. I never met him, uh, but I worked at the Nazarbayev Intellectual School in 2009. He created the Nazarbayev University and uh, 20 intellectual schools around the country, uh, and and I believe Belt and Road was announced uh, the new silk road uh they've changed the name one belt one road and then belt and road it was announced i think in 2013 by xi jinping from nazarbayev uh university in uh astana and you got to meet uh the man the myth uh the legend uh nur sultan and and i think kazakhstan as they call it it's it's a belt it is a key node in this uh belt and road and so you know any thoughts on on kazakhstan uh or, or nazarbayev <laughs> That's I, I, well, yes, I had dinner with him and uh, other, several other people. Uh, and, yeah, it was quite a time I talk in the book about 
you know, he has a pretty bad reputation as a group, you know, having done some brutal things and so on and so forth. And I'm like, well, why am I being invited to this dinner? All these other people are, you know, you know, very high up in different governments. And who am I? But anyway, it turned out to be good, <laughs> interesting uh, meeting. Uh, you know, and, and Kazakhstan is in this critical position. Uh, it's a People in the United States don't even know where it is. A lot of them, but uh, it's uh, it borders China and it borders Russia and it borders a lot of other countries. And it was always instrumental in the old Silk Road, you know, the one Marco Polo took, and that that, that connected Asia and Europe and parts of Africa. And now it's it's very instrumental in the new Silk Road and the new Silk Road or the Belt and Road Initiative is is intended to connect the whole world. And that's another amazing selling point that China has. So China tells countries in Latin America, for example, you're going to be part of this new Silk Road. The old Silk Road was all land. And the new Silk Road, that's the that's the belt part. You know, it's it's the highways, it's the communications channels that connect China with Europe and the rest of Asia and, and, and Africa. But the new Silk Road, the, the, the road part, is the sea lanes uh, and to some degree air plane lanes, but mainly sea lanes. And so, you know, China controls the, the the container ports at both ends of the Panama Canal. China owns them. It doesn't own the land. It owns the, it, you know, it's leased the land. It, it is building ports all over Latin America and, and other and various facilities to get things to the port. So it's telling, it has a story, that, again, that it can tell countries like Peru and Argentina in Brazil, look, you want to do what the United States did, which was to set up bilateral trade agreements with you. We're setting up a system where you will trade with everybody in the world. You'll have the opportunity to do that through this new Silk Road, this Belt and Road Initiative. So it's, again, an incredibly brilliant marketing strategy. And ultimately, I think it, it, it's intended to really serve China, to bring more resources to China. But it's a it's a it's 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 a brilliant you know when i first started hearing about it and got into it a lot when i was teaching at this university in shanghai and again in kazakhstan you know i thought to myself why didn't we think of that <laughs> but we didn't and and we're still and we're one of the few countries that hasn't really bought into it most of europe has bought into the idea all of africa has bought into it most of latin america has the, the, the chinese are beating the pants off us in terms of, you know, how they sell themselves to the rest of the world. And especially to countries that now have resources that will feed the green economy, lithium, cobalt, and so many of the other minerals and metals that, that are necessary for batteries and other things. Yeah, and, and the U.S. did try to respond to the Belt and Road with their own version. I think initially it was called Blue Dot Network, and then they changed it to Build Back Better. And not, I, I, as far as I can tell, absolutely nothing has happened with that and and i did give guest lectures at shakarim university in Semein, kazakhstan uh and, and they had their own china department created and financed by the chinese at the kazakh um, university so th the chinese have been spreading influence in in uh many ways and i, I did want to ask you as well you met also with sergey uh, glaziev um, top russian economist whose work I'm fascinated by and we're hearing all this talk now coming from the east about BRICS plus uh, everyone wants to join now I'm you know Belarus uh, just so many countries want to join BRICS and uh, Glaziev has talked about basically a new global Bretton Woods system and architecture uh, digital currencies uh, the pooling uh, of, of all these countries digital currencies backed by commodities and uh, you know your thoughts on all this action that's taking place in, in this Eurasia Global South. Well, yes, and uh, yeah, you mentioned Sergey, and, and he's you know we spent a lot of time together. He'd read my book, and I read his, and we had a mutual appreciation. There. I think he's one of the guys that's been sanctioned by the United States and a brilliant economist, uh, and and can be very very critical of Putin and, and the, the Russian system has been openly, even though he's one of Putin's top advisors. And and I said to him, how, how do you get away with it? We we in the we, we in the United States here that you can't do that. And he said, well, no, Putin likes to hear criticism. He doesn't necessarily follow it, but he that's why he tells me that's what he wants from me. He wants me to analyze what's going on. You know, we get very different impressions. But as far as the global South is concerned, and all of this, I think one a telling moment was last this past. December, a couple of months ago, uh, a meeting of the security group in, in Munich, Germany, 
And when people from countries all over the world came together, and it became obvious uh, the the difference of the worldview of what what was referred to as the transatlantic countries, which includes the United States and our uh, you know NATO and European Union countries, and the global south, which includes in this case China and India and some huge populations, Brazil. Uh, and the what came out was that the global south kind of sees Ukraine as a European white man's war. And there's a lot of resentment of the fact that so many resources are being devoted to Ukraine, whereas they haven't been devoted to trying to stop the terrible war that happened in the Congo, which was considered to be the worst war since World War II. Where, you know, so many people were killed. Uh, or to giving vaccines or the, the means the way to pr produce vaccines because of uh, you know copyright laws and so forth to to, to Africa and the global south uh, they see these resources being devoted to Ukraine but that not in the same way that the, the, are they devoted to the south they see a certain hypocrisy we kept hearing at this at the summit in in Munich about how well, it's it's hypocritical of the United States to cr criticize the invasion of Ukraine when the United States has invaded Iraq and Afghanistan and, and before that Vietnam and and threatens countries all the time. Uh, and so, you know, and and I'm not justifying either side. I'm just saying this division of understanding is uh, is it's terrifying. <laughs> Quite frankly, it's it's shocking and it's disturbing. And it's leading us in a very bad direction. The global south says, well, what's important in the world today is climate change and starvation. We've got starving people and a lot of malnourished people that aren't exactly starving, but they kind of are starving. And we've got terrible climate change. And all of this is driving the migration problems that you in the, in the, in the north are not really relating to. You're not really solving these problems. Um, and so they see they see the world situation very very differently and i'm sure you you're in mexico right now i'm i'm sure you're hearing a lot of that there and and i just came back last month from uh from being in in guatemala and costa rica and the bahamas and in a, a couple of months before that i was in ecuador and I spent a lot of time in Colombia and and we you know you hear something very very differently especially if you speak Spanish. If you only speak English, then you're pretty much going to hear the American side. But, you know, you hear something very different, as I'm sure you're extremely aware. Yeah, I well, in, in my case, I meet a lot of uh, Mexicans that are ge generally are indifferent to what's going on in Ukraine. But you have a division. You've got the more uh, educated Mexicans that go through the Academic system, but they're brainwashed with the American perspective, and so they'll support Ukraine. But then the ones that are paying attention that haven't gone through that system, uh, they can understand that you know it's it's uh, they view it as you know NATO expansion uh, provoking uh, uh, Russia. And um, just on that note, you wrote in your book as well that uh, China welcomes Russia's attempts to break U.S. hegemony and force U.S. and EU to devote a great deal of money and energy to Ukraine. And I've talked to European intellectuals on this podcast, and they, they're saying that one consequence of what's happening in Ukraine is you know, a huge inflation in the, in the U.S., decreased living standards in the U.S., especially Europe. This could collapse uh, Europe. And then I think you've also uh, in the book touched on, you said you often hear the idea that China is in decline and U.S. hegemony will prevail and i'm often also asking myself this question and so um so on one hand we see you, you, the standards in the west declining and do you feel the u.s will be able to you know remake itself in sort of a u.s Amer american empire 2.0 uh or that i mean you, you mentioned before it does clearly seem that china is rising and it's not going to collapse yeah i don't see China collapsing in any way, and I don't think we should we should hope for that. Uh, you know, what what the problem is 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 the leaders of countries. <laughs> you know, and that that throughout history has been pretty much the uh, the thing that has driven wars and so on and so forth. That in general, people don't want those, but they get you know they get riled up and and ready to go to war. Uh, can the U.S. regain hegemony? You know. I don't think so. And I don't think we want that. I don't think we want either country 
to have that. What, what we really want and what we need to strive for is an understanding that we all have the same needs. We all need clean air, <laughs> clean water, uh, nutritious food. Uh, we need that for all people. I have a 14-year-old grandson. And, you know, the only way he's going to inherit a, a world he'll want to live in when he's my age in his 70s is if every other child on this planet of, of all species inherits the world they want to live in. And that's what we need to strive for. We've got to stop this, this them versus us. And, uh, you know, in, in, I don't know who's right about this argument. Did, 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 did NATO push Putin or is Putin just out to build the world? I can't answer questions like that. I can see both sides of it. I can see both sides. And are we doing the same thing now to China that we kind of did to Russia under that argument? Are we pushing China to become more aggressive because we're getting more aggressive? I don't know. What I do know is that that the important things that we're dealing with are the death economy and transforming it, climate change. I, so climate change, income inequality, species extinctions, environmental destruction, those are problems, but they're not the problem. The problem is this death economy, economic system that's built on maximizing short-term materialistic consumption, short-term profits, short-term consumption, and it's not working. And it's also based on the idea of trickle down, you know, don't tax the rich and you let the rich get richer and richer and richer and, and, and cut social services on the poor, which we're talking about in the United States today. You know, there's all this denial, the extreme denial that we're going to get rid of Social Security or Medicare. But the fact that it's being denied so strongly is, is worrisome. You know, that means people are taking it seriously. Uh, so, uh, you know, we, we, we the, the important thing now for people to recognize is there is no them. There is no us. And I'm I'm struck sometimes by the idea. Let me ask you a question. So if there's a fleet of UFOs hovering above and the aliens are getting ready to attack us, let's assume these aliens are not friendly. They're getting ready to attack us. They're they're arming themselves. They've got incredible advanced weapons. They're getting ready to attack us. What is China and the United States and Russia going to do? I guess they're all going to point uh, together <laughs> collectively at the aliens now. Exactly. That's that's the history. Germany and Japan were both terrible enemies of the United States and what's now the NATO countries during World War II, but came together very quickly afterwards to 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 oppose the Soviet Union, the Cold War. This is a history of coming. So yes, China, the United States, Russia, we'd all come together to fight the aliens. Well, let's now admit that we are the aliens. We have alienated ourselves from our planet. We have defined ourselves as superior or human supremacy, human supremacy, not white, yeah, white supremacy is a terrible thing. Human supremacy is a terrible thing. We've defined ourselves as apart from, not a part of our planet. And that's fairly recent in history, indigenous people. And for the 200,000 years or so, we've been humans on this planet. We've, we've always seen ourselves as a part of living within the limits of nature. Only recently, we've said, no, 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 we're like gods. We can do whatever we want to the planet. There are no limits. And so we've alienated ourselves. We are the aliens. So let's understand that. Let's come together and say, listen, we can disagree on everything else. You know, we can criticize China for its treatment of the Uyghurs. It can criticize us for our treatment of immigrants. Uh, we can criticize China for what it's doing in Taiwan and Hong Kong. It, the Chinese can criticize us for what we're doing in Iraq and Afghanistan and Syria and other places. But let's all agree that there are no winners on a dead planet, and we've got to come together to change the economic system that is destroying life as we know it. Yeah, and you can conclude, you know, saying that we need to end the um, economic hitman model once and for all. And you know, when you say death economy, for me, uh, the most important, personally, you know, issues that I view is again the economic uh, inequality. Which we're we're seeing we're seeing the middle class erode globally. Uh, you know, here in Mexico, uh, I, I talk to people in the U.S. Uh, I got a friend that comes on my show. He's a full time professor uh, in the U.S. Married, he can't. He's got a full time job, and they cannot afford uh, a, ba a house to buy. Real, you know, they're everyone everywhere is being priced out of real estate. So economic quality and um, pollution. Uh, you know, there are for me, there are some things I question when it comes to uh, aspects of climate change. But I can tell you right here uh, on my patio in Mexico, 
There's black suits coming in daily. There's factories around here, uh, and there's you know this pollution. And I don't know. I I I'm I I got to get out of the city. The, the only way I can see for myself to change that is going to farm somewhere. But um, yeah. And any further thoughts on ending the EHM model once and for all, and what pe- what people can do to slowly try to bring about a life uh, economy. Well, you know, in that book you keep holding up, my most recent book, I have a, a, a lot of suggestions uh, for what every individual can do. I think it's important for us to recognize that we're all victims, but we're also collaborators, uh, you know, and we can blame big corporations and we should, uh, but we got we should recognize that we're all consumers and many of us are investors or we're employees of these corporations. We have control. And I I talk in the book about how we got to turn these corporations around. And then I think, but, you know, there's a lot of practical things like that we can all do, participate in uh, social network uh, consumer movements. That's a very easy thing to to, to send an email to whatever corporation you want to see change and say, hey, I love your products, but I'm not going to buy them anymore until you pay your workers in Indonesia a fair wage or or clean up the pollution you've caused. And when you do that, I'll see to it that thousands of people buy your products again. And then you circulate that to all your social networking circles and ask them to do the same. And these things have impact on on investors. We're seeing that increasingly that investment in like uh, uh, Warren Buffett and and, and others and institutional investors are looking to the long term, realizing that they want to invest in corporations that are not just maximizing short term profits. That is happening, and we need to f- push it to happen further. But I also suggest to people that we, each one of us asks ourselves a, a quest, five questions. And I'll very quickly summarize them, but but they're in the book in more detail because we're all different. So there's no one solution. The first question is, what is it you most, what is it I most want to do for the rest of my life? And I would answer that by saying, I like to write. I want to keep writing. And a, a friend of mine who's a carpenter at the opposite end of the spectrum says, you know, I want to work with my hands and wood. The second question is, how do I do this in a way that helps transform the death economy to a life economy? And I'd say, I'm going to write about things that inspire people to do that, as I have in this book. My carpenter friend would say, I'm only going to use sustainable materials. The the third question is, what's keeping you from from doing it? What's the blockage? And I might say as a writer, well, I know i got to write every day if I want to be a successful writer, and I I don't have time. My carpenter friend might say, well, my, my clients don't want to pay the extra price for sustainable materials. The fourth question is, so when you confront that, when you literally look at that blockage, how do you see what the perception is and how do you change it? So for me, it would be, well, wait, I could turn off the television for one or two hours every night and write, and that would give me another seven to 14 hours a week. That's a lot of time for writing. That would help. My carpenter friend says, well, I'm going to tell my clients that if there's an extra price for sustainable materials, it's not a cost. It's an investment in the future. And the fifth question is, what actions do I take? Well, I got to get down and write. The cabinet friend's got to build this cabinet here with sustainable materials of the house and tell his clients and their children, look, this is an investment in the future. But I think regardless of whether you're a journalist, a podcast host, a plumber, a parent, a teacher, whatever you are, <laughs> working in retail, whatever you are, retired, you can participate in this to say, what do I want to do for the rest of my life? And how can I do this in a way that will help promote a life economy? We can all do this. And it's fun. I mean, you know, we got to have fun doing this stuff or we're not going to be successful. You know, this, yeah, everybody's got to wash the dirty dishes after a good meal. So there's always some little you know, aspects of the job you don't like quite as well. There's aspects of editing I don't like as much as I do in the initial. But I that, that that's part of you know so this there's, there's little things that you get but you gotta your, your main aim has to be to really do what you most want to do what'll bring you the greatest bliss yeah you mentioned uh editing you know i love doing podcasts but when it comes to time to sit down and edit i sometimes uh procrastinate and speaking of television you just chuck your tv out the window i i, I haven't had a tv for over uh um a decade and uh, I did want to mention something that also struck me earlier in your book. You discuss your very early experiences in, in uh, Ecuador many decades ago and this issue between uh, locals and the, the Ecuadorian oligarchs. And you basically 
discuss how the locals didn't need you to stand up for them. They needed to stand up for themselves and take offense to the injustices they had suffered to do whatever it took, including risking being uh, killed. And that's always been my philosophy. And I think we have to have this courage and bravery to confront injustices, whether we, you know, global stuff we're seeing or, or, or locally. And I, I think most recently of Robert F. Kennedy Jr., who's running for president now as a Democrat, this might be the first time I ever vote a Democrat. And, you know, I, you know, his uncle was taken out, his father, and he's willing to be taken out to do whatever it takes to fix the corrupt system. And I think uh, for me, that's a gr- right uh, attitude. Any any final thoughts for us then? Well, I, I, I write in the book about how I was poisoned at one point and had uh, 70% of my colon removed as a result right after confessions came out just before I was supposed to speak at the United Nations. And uh, that's a pretty scary thing to go through. But I and and I realized, and I, my life was threatened before that. And uh, but I've realized that the, the more scary thing is not to do anything. As I mentioned, I have grandchildren, but it doesn't matter whether we actually have our own children or not. We we live on this planet, and uh, you know the it, it may take a little courage to get out there and and really follow your dream and follow your bliss. But it's 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 worth it. And and the scary thing is not to do it. You know, to, to have to live with yourself saying, I, you know, to, to, to be on, to think that you might be on your deathbed and look back and say, damn, why didn't I do that? Or why did I do that and not, not do what I really wanted to do and what I know is best for the world? There's nothing that brings greater satisfaction than to feel that we're passing on to future generations a legacy uh, that they will want to inherit. And, you know, that's, that's, that's so wonderful. And the scary thing is to, to put yourself in a p- p- position where you're not even trying to do that. So I think I, I, I think your listeners, all of them, should feel very blessed, frankly, to live at this time. It's a time of great crises, great challenges, and tremendous opportunities. We are in an evolutionary process. You know, we're we're having a consciousness revolution, a, a true uh, re- revisioning of what it means to be what it means being human beings being on this planet. I, I, I did want to add, I forgot to mention just on the final note of the life uh, economy, some of my sponsors, which I think align with this philosophy, the Nomos Time, time Bank, uh, where you try to get, it's in English and Spanish where people can download it. And then in their local communities, they can uh, use time as a currency and uh, as well, the uh, above phone, which uh, sells degoogled phones, which they have a philosophy against you know big tech uh, privacy and and surveillance and sort of taking uh, privacy into our own our own hands and uh, taking agency over that uh i'll include all of your links uh in the description again um i highly recommend uh people check out the third edition even if you've read it there's a lot of new stuff um and it was refreshed it was refreshing to reread uh parts of it uh i, I read it I yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah you got a couple um uh, i'll include your links again but you know where's the best place to find you uh get the book or any other project you want to mention johnperkins.org and i don't sell the book myself but there's the, the, there's links there to play for yeah, people's local, local bookstore everything wherever you want to buy it or the online vendors so and I'd ask people if they read it and like it, please write a review on Amazon. Because even if you don't buy from Amazon, regardless of what you think of Amazon, the word gets out. And we, it, you know, my main thing about it is not so much selling books as it is getting people to really dig into the subject and spread the word of, of how much, how terribly important and urgent it is that we transform the death economy to a life economy. Yeah, I, I, I'm definitely going to leave a review. And I, I'd agree, it's not about uh, money. Most of the time, people don't make uh, so much money in the books. It's, it's get, getting the, the information and ideas out. So thank you for being on Geopolitics and Empire, John. My, my pleasure. Thank you for having me and for all you do to spread the word and get these messages out. I so appreciate your uh, what, what you're doing uh, to, to, to make the world a place that future generations will want. Thanks. I hope you enjoyed this Geopolitics and Empire podcast. The website is geopoliticsandempire.com, and I encourage you to sign up for the free email list that goes out with each podcast and every weekend with a collection of news headlines. The newsletter and website are our last lines of defense. We're being censored and deplatformed. It's nearly impossible to find Geopolitics and Empire on the Google search engine. We've been blacklisted. 
YouTube frequently takes down our videos with strikes. Facebook restricts our page. Reddit and Twitter take down posts. And after the Associated Press mentioned geopolitics and empire in a 2021 article co-written with NATO, our Patreon account was terminated. Vimeo also terminated our pro account. The best free way to help geopolitics and empire is to leave a review on Apple Podcasts or elsewhere and subscribe to all of our media channels. You can find the video broadcast now on five platforms, Odyssey, Rockfin, Rumble, BitChute, and Brighteon. You can find the audio broadcast on the podcast ecosystem, SoundCloud, Apple, Spotify, and so on. My current favorite social media channels are Twitter and Telegram, but you can also find us on Gab, MeWe, Minds, Float, VK, Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Finally, Geopolitics and Empire is in dire need of funding to continue. You can leave a donation, purchase a consultation with the host, or become a member to receive additional benefits. We also produce a weekly broadcast called Dissident Thinker for members and Rockfin subscribers only. We will continue to fight the good fight come hell or high water. Thank you for listening.